Well, good morning, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to Brookings. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with everybody here today, and we're uh, about a week away from uh, Pre President Obama's meeting with Prime Minister Modi. Uh, the President is on his way to New York. The Prime Minister will soon be on his way to New York uh, for, the, for the UN General Assembly meetings. And then they'll be coming, for, uh, coming back to Washington for um, uh, a working meeting, as opposed to a, a, state, uh, a state summit or a state level visit. Um, today, we've put together a great panel discussion, and then it'll be followed with um, Strobe Talbot interviewing uh, and having a conversation with Elliot Engel, the ranking uh, minority member on the House International Affairs Committee. In a, uh, along with discussing India-US relations, we're rolling out with this event a new Brookings India Initiative Briefing Book, uh, the Modi-Obama Summit, a leadership moment for India and the US. Um, the Brookings India Initiative is a uh, integrated two-part structure. Um, on the US side, it's led by um, the India Project here at Brookings, uh, which Tanvi Madan runs. And in India, our great partners at the, uh, India, the Brookings India Center in New Delhi, who I just had the pleasure of visiting with uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, the book was released by our center in India last week with a discussion that included um, Piyush Goyal, who's the Minister of State with Independent Charge for Power, Coal, and New and Renewable Energy, um, and Shyam Saran, who's the Chairman of India's National Security Advisory Board. Um, the briefing book is also available at brookings.edu uh, backslash Modi Obama Summit. And for those tweeting the event today, the hashtag we're using is hashtag Modi US. Uh, I'd like to thank all the scholars who contributed to the briefing book, as well as our staff who helped put it together, um, and in DC, DC especially, uh, Nia Agarwal and Jessica Brandt, as well as our foreign policy and central communications teams. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, I was in India and I, I read the book, I contributed a piece myself, um, and then read the entire book uh, in about an hour and a half on the flight on the way over, and it was a spectacular briefing and we've had uh, terrific praise from both U.S. government officials and uh, Indian government officials on the um, concision but also uh, uh, complete nature of the book. It covers quite a lot, so I really do uh, recommend it to you. Most of the essays are between 700 words and 1,000 words, um, and they're an overview of all the essays you would want to deal with. Um, and so today we have um, three of the authors, uh, actually four of the authors, including myself, um, in the book, uh, starting from my right and going to my left, Tanvi Madan, who I'd mentioned before, runs the India Project here at Brookings. Uh, and as a fellow in our foreign policy program, uh, she has expertise that covers everything from uh, uh, the basic diplomatic relationship between the United States and India, as well as the US-India-China triangle. But she's also written on energy security in India and a host of other issues. Um, she PhD from uh, University of Texas, Austin, and uh, is also a Brookings alumnus. She came up through the foreign policy program, so she's really been part of our family for some time. Uh, to my immediate left is Josh Meltzer, who's in the uh, global economy program. Josh writes on uh, global trade uh, and investment, uh, including everything from the World Trade Organization to uh, data flows cross borders. Uh, he also writes on climate change. Uh, so along with uh, Tanvi and me, uh, we all share a common passion and interest for energy and climate issues. And then um, on my far left, uh, uh, spatially, not politically, uh, is uh, Neil Ruiz from our Metropolitan Policy Program. Uh, Neil writes on a number of different issues, but in particular is quite interested in, um, and as it relates particularly to India, um, immigration and high-tech immigration. Uh, H-1B visas and the like. When I was in India two years ago working on my book, uh, Neil was working on uh, the inverse story of something that I was quite interested in, which was um, the high-tech immigrants coming out from India. I was focused on geographically where they were coming from in India, and he was focused on geographically where they were going to in the United States. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have each of the panelists talk for a few minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation with them. So I think... I Thank you, Bill, uh, and thank you all for coming. What I'm going to do is set the stage for the visit. Why is Mr. Modi coming to the US? Uh, why is he being welcomed? 
uh, talk about a little about the visit itself uh, and what might stem from it, uh, as well as the, the way forward. And I'll try to do that as concisely as possible. Uh, when Prime Minister Modi came to office in May, uh, there was little expectation that he would focus on foreign policy. Um, the campaign had been, as most campaign, election campaigns often are in India and in many other places, including here, quite focused on domestic issues, including the economy. Um, but what we've seen in the last few months since Mr. Modi has taken office uh, has been a focus on foreign policy that has been significant. Uh, and I don't think it's surprising because that foreign policy is very much linked uh, to Mr. Modi's uh, domestic goals. And so what we've seen is we saw initially uh, a set, an approach to the neighborhood, uh, including to Pakistan uh, as well as Nepal. Uh, then we saw a kind of outreach to a uh, number of Asian countries. Mr. Modi visited Japan. Uh, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping of China was just, uh, was, uh, just in India. Uh, and we also saw, for example, from the kind of broader Asia Pacific, uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott from Australia and India recently as well. The Indian president went out to Vietnam. I mention this because I think the visit to the US is part of this continuum. And it is related uh, to these other visits. Uh, Mr. Modi comes to the U.S. Uh, and will continue his, uh, his kind of travel through the autumn. Uh, but this visit in particular is something that's getting a lot of attention. Why, why is Mr. Modi coming here? Why does he consider the U.S. important? This question is even being raised because there was also some expectation when he came to office uh, that he would hold the U.S. at arm's length uh, because of the revocation of his visa in the mid-2000s. Uh, and the lack of official American engagement with him uh, for a few, uh, for the last uh, few years, and not since the last year, but the few years before that. Uh, how, and there were two options that Mr. Modi could have chosen. He could have chosen option A, uh, which is to hold the U.S. at arm's length, uh, pursue these relationships with other countries, and basically say, okay, the U.S. relationship is there, but I'm not going to pay too much attention to it. What we've actually seen him do is choose option B. Uh, which is say uh, that I am going to actually reach out to the U.S. and reciprocate uh, the outreach from the administration, and it has been significant uh, over the last few months, uh, to, to take this relationship forward. So why is the U.S. relationship important for India? Why is Mr. Modi coming here? It's what, what is a fairly busy time for him and for Mr. Obama? Uh, he's coming here because, as he said, just before the election results uh, w were declared, the U.S. relationship is in India's interests. And I broadly outline uh, kind of a couple of broad areas. One is a strategic. Uh, India's, uh, India will need the U.S., and Indian officials have said that the U.S. will play an important role in managing the rise of China. Uh, Counterterrorism cooperation is another key area where the, the India and the U.S. actually do cooperate. There's also this aspect of kind of on the strategic side, competitive courting. A good relationship with the U.S., can redound to the benefit of India's other relationships, including with Japan, but also with countries like China and Saudi Arabia, as Indian officials admit. Uh, an India that the US takes more seriously, everybody else takes seriously, is something that you can hear Indian officials say. Uh, the second reason is economic. Um, the US, as a source of capital, as a source of technology and skills, something Mr. Modi has highlighted repeatedly, it is also a source of markets uh, for, it is also a market for U Indian investment uh, and Indian companies in the U.S. There are also aspects related to kind of the economic dimension, including energy needs, uh, that the U.S. will play a significant role in uh, moving forward. And overall, there's a sense that the U.S., and you, you hear this from Modi government officials who speak about this, that the U.S. can play a significant role in either facilitating India's rise uh, or in actually hindering it. So why is Mr. Modi being welcomed here? It is for that reason related to kind of India's rise. We've had a number of administration officials over the last few years, but also the administrations before this one, so the Bush administration, uh, but also going back to the year 2000 with President Clinton. And if you read his speech in, in India, it kind of outlines some of these uh, 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 similar themes, which is that India's rise is, is a net positive for the world, for, the, for India, for the US, and for the world, and that it was in US interest to support uh, this rise. Um, there are kind of three reasons, I think, administration officials, but even beyond, because this is not just a relationship between the two governments. Uh, it involves various levels. And you've seen 
kind of uh, proponents of the relationship in the US outline kind of three areas why they think India is important. Uh, one is geopolitical. Uh, and the geopolitical dimension has a lot to do with kind of India's role in Asia, uh, both West and East Asia, but specifically what you hear is kind of the, the relating of India to China. That India, by its very nature, if it grows, even if it does nothing to actively support uh, the US strategy towards China, that India, if it grows, if it develops, if it strengthens, will automatically serve as a balancer to China and will help shape China's rise for the better. Economic, that it's an economic opportunity uh, for the US, for US companies there, but also in the reverse order, uh, that you do see um, uh, Indian companies investing here. You see American governors going out to India to get, uh, seek that investment uh, on a regular basis now. And I think there's this third dimension, uh, which is values. Uh, and you know sometimes uh, they can be downplayed, but the fact that the two countries are democracies, that there is a perception here that India as a democracy, if it succeeds, will help show the world uh, as a model, rather than in terms of any active democracy promotion, uh, will sh reflect if India grows and it grows well, the democracies can develop as well. That democracy and development aren't mutually exclusive. So this is the context in which you see Mr. Modi coming here. And President Obama reached out to him fairly immediately, uh, uh, called him. Uh, the administration has expressed uh, great hope uh, that the Modi government will be able to deliver on its promises of growth, governance, uh, and the ability to get things done. And they would like to see, uh, and I quote what Mr. Obama called, a strong, developed, and inclusive India that actively engages with the global community that Mr. Modi indeed uh, promised uh, during the election and after. This is the context kind of largely of the visit. What about the visit itself? Uh, what we're going to see is a two-pronged visit, one in New York and one in DC. Um, and what the expectations are, uh, and we can talk about the details of the event, um, but what we see is kind of in who Mr. Modi is uh, meeting, kind of it reflects the broad and deep relationship uh, of that India has with the US, that it's not just a G2G or a government to government and that to a federal government to government uh, relationship. And just a few examples of this is, Mr. Modi will be meeting uh, everybody from congressional leaders uh, to state leaders, uh, there, uh, uh, including uh, potentially the governor of New York. He'll be meeting with former Mayor Bloomberg to discuss smart cities. Uh, he'll be meeting with a number of private sector leaders. He will be meeting with administra administration officials at all. Uh, and then something that's actually um, hasn't been highlighted in previous visits as much, but is this time, uh, he'll be interacting with the Indian American community as well as society, uh, civil society groups, etc. The visit, what are the expectations of the visit? I think there's a style uh, element of the answer and there's a substance element of the answer. I think in terms of the style element, this is the first opportunity for President Obama and Prime Minister Modi to interact uh, uh, directly in person. Um, and and it, is, it will set the tone uh, for kind of the relationship moving forward. So I think it's important in that respect. Um, I think the second aspect is it does give a chance for the administration to highlight uh, or show, demonstrate respect for, uh, for not just India, uh, but the leader that India democratically elected. Uh, a third aspect is kind of highlighting I mean, and this is not, I think, active, but will be, will be a passive contrast, which is if you look just a year ago at the relationship, uh, this was kind of a summer of discontent of India-US relations. Uh, there were, the, the sentiment on the Hill wasn't great because of a few economic differences. Uh, there was also the aspect that Mr. Modi uh, could not have visited US a year ago. And uh, now he's been welcomed with open arms. So I think that aspect, that it is a significant visit uh, for that, uh, for that, um, uh, for the, those reasons, there will be substance. We might not see too many kind of uh, big deals announced, uh, but there will be a fair amount of substance. And I think it's important to put this in perspective. Uh, what this visit has also done in terms of substance is acted as a action-forcing event, which is to get the bureaucracies on both sides and the political leaderships focused on this visit at a time when both countries are preoccupied with other domestic and, and foreign policy priorities. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, we are likely to see uh, some discussions 
uh, or we might not see, but there's likely to be discussion on the foreign policy side of key areas of interest for both countries, including uh, as you look west from Asia, uh, from India, sorry, uh, into Afghanistan and Pakistan, as well as the broader Middle East, where India has key concerns. It is an important part of the region uh, for India as well. And then looking east, uh, including uh, India's relationship with China and the US relationship with China in recent development, as well as kind of uh, India, US, Japan trilateral, these are likely to be subjects of discussion. Uh, on the security policy side, you're likely to see discussions on counterterrorism cooperation, uh, but you're also likely to see uh, talks about defense cooperation. Potentially, we might see a few deals announced on the defense trade side, uh, though the, the administrations on both sides have been trying to keep expectations low, but there is hope that they will actually get some uh, deals done. Just to give you a sense of defense trade, uh, if you looked just a decade and a half ago, uh, there was almost no defense trade. Today, the figures are at about standard about $12 billion of defense trade. The U.S. has uh, gone from becoming kind of a 0% share of Indian uh, defense purchases uh, to kind of close to seven, uh, actually over 7% uh, just in uh, the last 15 years, years. And I think the other thing that you were, uh, and this is by the way expected to go up to $14 billion uh, next year. I'm going to let my colleagues cover some of the other economic uh, and people to people ties that, uh, that kind of feature. Uh, but I will say that, you know, broadly the number of, you, you will see a broad range of discussions. Some we won't see. We're not going to see some of the discussions that they will have on other key issues. Uh, but I do think what you're going to see is uh, discussions on taking forward, or at least initial discussions on taking forward. Uh, a number of the opportunities that do lie ahead and are featured in this, uh, in this briefing book, and I would encourage you to read it. Uh, and you will see that moving forward, I think we, this visit should be seen not as the beginning of something, uh, but, or the, oh, sorry, the culmination of something, but the beginning of kind of this next phase of the relationship. And the next two years of the, the Obama years could be uh, significant if both sides actually achieve the potential. Let me finish my remarks with just highlighting some of the obstacles that do lie ahead for the two, and they will have to confront. Uh, there's likely to be a focus on the optimistic side, on the opportunities, as there should be in some ways uh, for the next week or so, but just some of the obstacles. And since Prime Minister Modi likes alliterations, let me outline the seven Ds or the seven dangers. The first is drift. Uh, as I said, both countries are very preoccupied with other domestic and foreign policy priorities. Are, is, are they going to have the time and the, uh, for this relationship? Are they going to be able to pay attention to this relationship? Uh, especially if there's no kind of big crisis and nobody should hope for one. Um, the second is a danger that differences will dominate. And they do exist, and my colleagues will outline some of them in their areas. And the foreign policy side, they potentially exist with Pakistan, uh, with Iran, uh, with Russia perhaps, and also on the multilateral stage. Uh, third, um, difficulties related to dealing with another democracy. This relationship, unlike some of the others, is going to take place in, uh, in the media glare. This is the strength of both countries, but it also makes it harder sometimes to take this relationship forward. Uh, the, the fourth is an aspect uh, that creates both opportunities and more constituencies for the relationship, but also creates more hurdles in terms of implementation, and that is decentralization. Uh, Bill and others have talked about this at great length, which is this is a relationship that now involves states, it involves multiple stakeholders, uh, and this means that it's, it's harder to get for the governments to get things done. I'll give you a quick example, uh, the LNG deals to ex US exports of LNG to India. This cannot be eventually decided or a US-India nuclear deal. The implementation involves the private sector. This is not something that the federal governments can achieve alone. Um, I, uh, another one of the Ds is domestic politics and capacity, uh, affecting, again, the, the country's ability to actually implement any of the agreements they reach. And finally, uh, disillusionment uh, with each other if expectations are left unmet, uh, which could lead eventually to the dilution of uh, each other's importance in, uh, in the two countries' strategies. So I'll um, end there. Thanks. Thanks, Tommy. Um, yeah, great. Thanks. I'm going to focus on the trade and economic dimension to the US-India relationship and what this can be achieved and what this means in the context of the visit. I mean, I think when we think about the opportunities here, it's just worth taking a step back and thinking about where India is currently in the context of the global economy and I think where it would like to 
see itself go, because I think that's part of the way that Prime Minister Modi um, is thinking about the opportunities and the challenges for India going forward and how the um, importance of the bilateral trade and economic relationship plays out in that space. But, I mean, it's clear that India has potential to be a very large economy over the next 10, 15 years. There are different projections out there. There are some which suggest India could be the world's third largest economy by 2025. It's currently the world's 10th largest economy. And in order for India to achieve that, um, Tampi has outlined some of the domestic and foreign policy challenges along the road. Uh, but part of it's certainly going to be building out the bilateral relationship with the United States, which currently, on all dimensions, is clearly lacking and um, provides a lot of room for uh, growth and opportunity. Um, part, part of that is certainly going to be, I think, a focus on encouraging increased United States investment into um, India, which currently is exceptionally... I mean, it, it's low by any measure... Um, it's, it's in, the stock is in the range of, of $30 billion, which is at least um, half that um, of what's been going on um, in China. And I'll go into a little bit more why I think that's going to be a very important component here. If you look at just the, um, the trading relationship, though, is actually even significantly, in a sense, um, lacking than the investment relationship, where, again, if you sort of look at China, which I think is a different country, but just useful as a neighbour with a similar large population, uh, US trade with China is, is in the realm of nine to ten times on the good side larger than uh, US trade um, with India. So coming off very low base, but obviously lots of room and opportunity for growth there. And I think that's certainly going to be something that is going to be part of not only the conversation that the Prime Minister will be having with, um, with the President here, but also in terms of his other engagements, particularly uh, with the business community in New York. One part of the relationship which has been growing and I think offers some very unique potential here is on the services side. Um, there, we, there actually has been a lot of growth in that relationship over the last 10 years and it's not one of an un, unalloyed um, sort of, you know, opportunity in the sense that there are political risks associated with that growth. In the United States, at least, the concern on the services side, which has played out more broadly into this issue about offshoring jobs and particularly um, the extent that sort of, you know, white-collar, higher-paying US services jobs actually can be done in India. Um, but putting that issue aside, which is certainly a narrative that needs to be navigated here, it's clear that the um, offshoring, which um, essentially has been really led by US businesses in India in particular, has been of very large benefit for um, a segment of the Indian population that has managed to go into that part of the economy, which is increasingly employing higher educated, um, skilled workforce. Um, but from a productivity side for US businesses, it has also been um, extremely beneficial. And the gr op growth opportunities there uh, keep getting larger, essentially, as IT and internet opportunities expand the scope for a lot of tasks and services to be done in India there. This links in, I think, with what is clearly going to be a focus of the Prime Minister, both when you think about his international um, focus and also in terms of what he needs to do, do, do domestically, which is basically building up the manufacturing sector in India. I mean, what's clear is that India has followed, in a sense, a development pathway, which is atypical, which is that it's gone into... Um, sort of high-tech, high-end services um, and not utilise um, what is a very large pool of, um, you know, sort of re relatively low-educated, um, low-cost low labour to build out a manufacturing sector. And I think there's a variety of reasons why that has not happened yet. And there is a clear understanding, I think, in the um, Indian business community and the Indian bureaucracy about what needs to be done to grow out the manufacturing sector. And the vast majority of the steps that have to be taken there are domestic reform efforts through things to do with infrastructure and the like, and we can talk more about that. But certainly, um, the, the, India, the potential for India is not only going to be in the, the pool of low-cost labour, but in fact, linking its growth in the manufacturing sector with this already strong services sector. Um, because what we do understand now is, in fact, that manufacturing is, embodies large amounts of uh, services. And 
in a sense, the, um, the, the, the fact that India already has a relatively well-developed services sector, I think, bodes well for India actually moving up the value-added chain on the manufacturing side fairly quickly, and a well-targeted strategic approach to that area stands to um, produce a lot of benefits for, um, for India in that, in that regard. Now, one of the key meetings, actually, I think that uh, the Prime Minister will be having when he visits uh, the US um, will obviously be with the President, but also will be his meeting with business CEOs. And I think that um, in terms of that meeting, you know, this is part of, a sense, a, a roadshow to both, I think, understand what have been the key concerns that US businesses have, have, have had with investing in India over the last decade. And there have been many, um, in fact, and a lot of disappointment at the end of the day with, with Prime Minister Singh, and this has included a range of issues um, from tax. There was, um, in a sense, uh, some um, backsliding on promises to open up the retail sector. Uh, there was little progress on infrastructure, which is going to be key um, across the board if India really is going to stand any opportunity of building out this um, the manufacturing sector in any serious way. I think the Prime Minister brings a lot of credibility with him. He, as, as State Minister in Gujarat, he was seen as achieving you know, respectable levels of economic growth and having a good understanding about the type of environment the businesses need to invest with. So I think that's definitely a strong plus, but I think there's also an understanding that um, being Prime Minister of India carries with it a whole lot of additional challenges and whether he can, in fact, deliver, I think, is going to be one of the question marks which we're only going to really learn about over time. Um, but, you know, that, that credibility that, that he brings with him, I think, is going to be very important in convincing the business community in the United States that um, he knows what it takes to put India on the pathway which is going to substantially change the business environment in a way which we're going to see a significant increase in investment into, um, into India over time. Now, in, in his meeting uh, with, with, with President Obama, it's... Um, Clear, I think, that one of the issues that they're going to raise is the um, Indian, in a sense, about face on the WTO deal that was agreed in Bali, the trade facilitation um, agreement in particular, uh, which required India essentially to uh, take a series of steps by the end of July in order to implement it, which at the end of the, the, the day decided not to do, which has now put the whole deal into question. And this is not only about... Um, the deal in, in itself, which is of significance um, to, to the world, but it's also about essentially uh, both the future of the WTO and it's also, I think, even more importantly about the credibility of India um, when it comes to doing deals with India. There was a lot of late nights and missed deadlines in the lead up to actually securing the Bali package and a sense that um, everyone had negotiated in good faith and this was a deal that everyone could live with. It was definitely a previous government that had done that, but at the end of the day, it was India. And um, I think that, you know, the, uh, the, the decision so far has created a lot of negativity in terms of perception, um, which is not a good thing in terms of where I think Prime Minister Modi wants to um, take India. And I think there's going to be a need to try to use this visit to address some of that. I'm sure that's going to come up in the conversation um, probably with the CEOs as well. But the US is certainly going to push uh, the Prime Minister on trying to resolve this issue. And I think finding a pathway forward for India on this is going to be um, important, not just in terms of the immediate um, trade issues wrapped up into this WTO package, but in just in terms of the broader perception of India um, in the global community, in the global economic community um, going forward. The other um, part of the, the, the picture here, which... Um, is, is India's, if India, India's also, and Prime Minister Modi has articulated this as um, a goal for India this is to become a global trader. And I think, again, this is part of a sense that India has a lot of potential, that it's not being reaching that potential, and part of that is to be more globally engaged. And I think these are all very good signals. And India, though, um, coming off the WTO decision, but also looking back over the last 10 years, in many respects has been outside a lot of the main um, trade negotiations that have going on. The most important one in the region for India is the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, which is a 12-member negotiating group, which includes the United States, um, um, Japan, 
Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, a bunch of countries which are themselves are fairly significant um, training partners for India, but the, the aim of the TPP is to also broaden it out into an Asia-Pacific deal, and it's not clear at this stage um, when, if ever, India could join that, and certainly I think that, again, its decision on the WTO trade facilitation agreement doesn't play well um, into a sense in the United States, at least, about the credibility of India as a negotiating partner in any of these deals going forward. So, again, I think that's one of the challenges that needs to be addressed, not just on the credibility space, but in terms of what do these trade agreements mean for India going forward? Um, if India sees itself, itself as being increasingly integrated into global supply chains, which I think building out the manufacturing sector implies, then how does India do that if it's not part of some of the key trade deals that are being done in that part of the world? Um, and there are other trade agreements which India is not part of, which I think are also going to be increasingly significant for India. There is an agreement being negotiated in the context of the WTO called the Trade in Services Agreement, uh, which China has formally indicated that it wants to join um, and includes approximately 40-odd other WTO members and will be focused solely on liberalising services markets and clearly giving India's services industry and its export orientation not being part of that at this stage, I think, potentially spells out um, some problems for that sector going forward. So, again, being part of these agreements has got to be part of, I think, India's sort of overall strategy going forward. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and pass over to Neil. Neil? Well, thank you. Um, uh, what I'm going to focus on is about the people-to-people -people exchanges between India and the United States. Um, first, let's start with the basics. Indian immigrants are th the third largest immigrant group in the United States, and they are high-skilled. Um, in 2012, 64% of all the temporary immigrants on the H-1B visas, these are for high-skilled sk high specialized workers, were Indian. Um, and Indians also are the second largest source of foreign students in the United States that are on F-1 visas, 15% of all students studying in the higher education. But they're also very STEM-oriented, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, majority of, of Indians are working in STEM occupations, two-thirds of them, um, uh, as well as 70% of all Indian students in the U.S. are pursuing degrees in the STEM fields. And majority of Indians studying in the U.S. are studying for graduate degrees. Almost 80% of them are pursuing master's degrees, PhDs at 11%, and then less 10% are bachelors. So this is a really interesting kind of exchange of, of trade, of, of a flow of people coming into the U.S. And this is intimately connected to U.S. Um, in several ways. First is providing skilled labor to fill STEM occupations in, for U.S. companies in the U.S., um, there's a lot of uh, founders of companies in Silicon Valley and other tech hubs within the United States founded by Indian um, graduates from U.S. universities. And we even see the head of, the, uh, of Microsoft also from, from India. So there's a large kind of this connection in the business, higher education, and the flow of, of workers into the U.S. And Indian students are, foreign students in the U.S. are a big service export. Um, they brought in over $5 billion over a five-year period into the U.S. for tuition and living costs in the U.S. So this is really not just about the people, but it also helps facilitate trade. It actually offers a lot of revenues for, for U.S. businesses, companies, and our, um, our economy. So what are the issues if this is such a high-skilled demographic? Because everything on immigration is focused a lot on the sticking points with, within the border with the South, focusing on, um, on the, the children of migrants, but, but there's a lot of contributions around U.S. immigration from India. And this is on three fronts. First, there's been a large debate, is there a shortage in STEM workforce in the U.S.? A lot of protectionists, especially labor unions that have a very um, kind of powerful presence in the President Obama's administration, have um, accused a lot of Indian IT headquartered um, companies uh, and outsourcing companies of monopolizing H-1B visas and using the what they call the L-1 visas is to um, transfer um, workers from India to the U.S. Um, for importing cheap labor into the U.S. So this has been a quite a big sticking point, a lot of accusations. Um, there's even been legal um, attacks on a lot of Indian companies, um, one famous on Infosys about last year. Um, accusations and that companies actually deny, but they settle. 
with the U.S. government so that it could continue to use the visa program. But last year also, U.S. Senate passed a bill, an immigra comprehensive immigration reform bill, that actually had a sunset clause that wouldn't essentially ban Indian IT companies from importing um, workers into the U.S. Um, because they have a, many companies have a large proportion of their U.S. workforce on H-1Bs or L-1 visas. If they had 50 to 70 percent of them, they would basically not be able to um, acquire an H-1B visa. And that was passed in the Senate. Um, and a lot of Indian IT firms are popular, again, for providing services to U.S. companies. Um, it's, it's unfortunate because there's a lot of debate around this because especially with offshoring, this is a different, this is the reverse. It's insuring, insourcing jobs into the U.S. where a lot of companies like uh, Tata, Infosys, Wipro have a large business of, of doing client-based work. This is work that cannot be outsourced to India but requires um, workers physically with helping clients, U.S. companies in the U.S. But this is something that's not just restricted to Indian IT companies. A lot of American headquarter companies are also in the same business. IBM, Accenture, um, huge, um, also providing services to U.S. Um, companies. And the unintended consequences of these restrictions, if it was passed, would have um, actually allowed, favored a lot of the American companies, annoy, which did annoy a lot of um, Indian IT companies, and would eventually kind of charge U.S. companies a lot more. It would have had unintended consequences of charging higher fees for these same client-based services that a lot of companies need for IT services. And we have to remember that India is pretty much the global, the competitive advantage is in the IT industry. As you know. The second front is finding a visa for Indian workers or any foreign worker in the U.S. is problematic. Um, these bills didn't pass, um, and the H-1B visa has a cap every year, um, and it's in an archaic system right now where on a first-come, first-served basis every April, companies um, vie for these 85,000 H-1B visas. And in the last two years, it's been so um, difficult that we had to actually have a lottery. The U.S. government had to have a lottery both years, um, which denied over 40, 50,000 um, visas um, to, to employers. And so when it comes to permanent residency, that's even another problem. Um, for Indians, um, it's if, if you are sponsored for, from an H-1B visa to become a permanent resident of the United States on a green card, you could be waiting for 10 plus years for your green card. And this has a lot to do with the immigration system that we have, which doesn't allot um, more than 7% of, of our green cards to any one country. And this system was originally made to make sure that we have a diversified um, pool of people from different countries, but it doesn't take into account the changes in the global economy. India, China, many of these countries became powerful. They have a huge flow of, of students coming to the U.S. India and China, again, are the biggest um, for sources of students to the U.S. So they have a longest wait if they want to stay and, and work in the U.S. Um, and for many foreign student graduates of U.S. universities, they would have to wait. They not only have to you know, get an, be lucky to get an H-1B visa, they have to go through the obstacles of, again, going through the green card process. This could wait 10 to 15 years before they know certainty if they're going to be staying in the U.S. permanently. And um, the third front is on higher education. Um, there's a large demand for higher education in India. As we know, in India, a lot of public universities haven't grown. So the huge demand, the economy is changing within India. So it makes sense that many of them are going abroad to find education. But in the US, there's been research that I released last month. It was kind of interesting to see the demographics of within India, where are students coming from that are studying in the United States? And as I showed in that report, Calcutta, um, most of the students there are going to study for PhDs in the US at top universities. Same with uh, Mumbai, India, mostly master's degrees at the top tier universities in the US. But then it was interesting when you look at Hyderabad and the surrounding southern India, which has recently grown a lot in the recent um, decade because of the IT and outsourcing of industry, are sending students to um, schools that we've never heard of. Um, this was caught on a lot by the Indian press because they were surprised that Hyderabad was the largest source of foreign students in the US, going to schools that have been closed down by the US government and um, because of fraud. 
or um, schools that were posing as employment agencies in, in lieu basically of providing a visa, kind of like because of the fact that we have less H-1B visas available. So this has become a problem, and it's something that um, to think about, um, even though this still represents a small portion of all um, foreign students, it's highly concentrated in the southern region of, of, of India that are coming to the US, um, into these um, diploma mills in the US. So how does the US and India move beyond the sticking point? I mean, these are quite difficult issues. Um, the first, the, the bad news, which could also be considered a good news, is that Congress hasn't done anything. Um, the House didn't agree. They didn't send a bill. Obama hasn't been able to sign anything. So nothing has been taken action. The only thing that currently that President Obama has been doing is allowing the spouses for H-1B workers to actually have work authorization in the US. Um, because this has been a big problem. If you're waiting in a long line for 10 plus years, your wife or husband cannot work, um, and most likely they're probably high skilled as well and highly educated. So that's one change that's on the pipeline, but right now there's a lot of um, uncertainty. So this is actually good news in the sense that it's opportunity for the new prime minister to talk to the administration openly about these issues. What I recommend is that the US really think through and talk with um, policymakers, talk with um, the Indian IT companies, as well as higher edu um, education students to really think about what is going on with this flow. Um, there needs to be kind of an understanding. There's misunderstandings of the business model of a lot of Indian IT companies. I think a lot of policymakers in the US automatically assume it's outsourcing, it's bad for the US. Um, and there needs to be an um, understanding that a lot of companies, whether you're Indian or American, are in the same business, which means that the global economy has changed and there's a lot of services that are needed, especially in IT. Um, and also I think President Obama should reiterate that there was bipartisan support for cleaning the mess of the green card um, wait. Um, both Republicans and Democrats, they've been in ag agreement. The House would have passed a bill, but they didn't. Um, that there's a lot of agreement on really just streamlining the visas for high-skilled immigrants. Thank you very much. Great. Well, Tanvi, his, uh, who is you know, the, the person who pulls the strings behind all things here at, at Brookings on India, asked me to say a few things about um, both my recent visit there and also uh, energy and climate, which I did the piece for this. And the two actually tie together quite well. Two years ago, I spent um, uh, nine weeks in India traveling around the, all parts of India doing this book on uh, Indian federalism, comparing it with China's system. And uh, I came across the Modi story and actually had uh, spent 90 minutes with Mr. Modi, uh, interviewing in particular about his growth strategy for Gujarat and the role that uh, power, uh, power generation, electricity, energy, and climate change played in his vision, because he actually has written a book. He's, I think, the only current uh, uh, head of state of the major economies to have written a book on climate change uh, called uh, Convenient Action, and it was written sort of in counterpoint to Al Gore's inconvenient truth. And he was trying to demonstrate that where in the United States we have these truths that are politically inconvenient, he took action and invested in, in addition to electric power generation through traditional means, uh, also uh, renewable energy, solar, hydro, uh, and the like. Um, it's a terrific theme for telling the story about Modi uh, and, and understanding the role that he plays in India. having not been back to India since being there two years ago, the, the sea change in the mood of the Indian public is extraordinary, not just in his BJP party. Remember, it's a parliamentary system, so he only won um, you know, sort of in the mid-30% of the vote. Um, but he won it in such dramatic fashion across much of India, not all of India. In the east and in the south, he didn't, um, his BJP party didn't win. But it was such a commanding victory in the lower house of parliament, uh, and one that hasn't been seen in, uh, in at least a generation, if, if beyond that, and such a commanding majority, but again, only in the lower house. Um, he doesn't control the upper house, and he doesn't control the various states of India. So he was elected on this mandate to grow the economy the way that he had done it in Gujarat. Uh, Yet, uh, he's still going to have to very much work with the states. And it's that tension between, uh, in this enormous federal system of India, remember this is 
uh, the population of North America, South America, and the 500 million people living in Europe. So if you think about that geopolitical diversity, that's what he's managing. Um, at almost as many languages, if not more languages, um, and even political diversity among those various states in terms of their uh, complexity. And there's only so many things that he can do centrally. He's going to have to really work with state level leaders both to get things through the upper house and then to get the states to implement a lot of these things and work at the state level. Uh, in, in fact, he's you know, sort of selling the Gujarat model globally, but he's going to have to go back and work with not just Gujarat, but Tamil Nadu and uh, more tricky places uh, politically like, like West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh and the new state of Telangana. I mean, this, this is the sort of complex challenge that he's facing dom domestically. He has enormous political will. There is high hopes and high expectations, um, including people in other parties. I had former Congress party um, parliamentarians and others tell me that they're really rooting for Modi. They think that this is a generational moment, and they think that his, his message of economic progress is an important one and that the country needs to rally, but politics are politics. People are going to um, oppose him both because they have different ideas, but also because um, uh, their party's interest is to make sure that, uh, that he doesn't succeed too much. And we've seen that in all kinds of different places, including here in the United States. Um, when it comes to power and energy and climate, I think that context is hugely important. First of all, he knows how to get it done. A lot of the levers for power and energy are at the state level. Uh, state electricity boards are hugely important in India on setting the prices for power and on collecting the fees. And those are the two most important things that he focused on and that he was effective at delivering. Um, coal is going to be a huge part of, energy, uh, of India's energy future. Um, and it will have to be a huge part of uh, India's energy future. The question is what kind of coal, um, both literally the kind of coal that is taken from the ground and burned, um, and how it's burned. Are they um, you know, cheap, re cheap thermal reactors or are they supercritical ones that are much more energy efficient and much more carbon efficient, as you will? And that's critical, not just from an economic standpoint and a local air pollution standpoint, but from a climate change standpoint. Um, India right now has very, very low per capita uh, climate greenhouse gas emissions. So looking ahead, first of all, we're in the middle still of this climate summit at the UN, which will transition into the General Assembly meeting. Um, Mr. Modi chose not to come for that, as did uh, as Xi Jinping also did. Um, but there are 100 or so, some odd heads of state who are coming. Uh, I think there's a two-part issue here. One is what the climate diplomacy, global diplomacy, looks like. That is, the formal diplomacy under the UN system, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and then also, uh, separate from that, what are the policies and measures that a country like India takes and how can they work with the United States on that? In the framework of the UN system, the transition that has been taking place for the last uh, four and a half, five years under the Obama administration is moving past the Kyoto architecture, which had two different levels of participation. There were the industrial countries, which were, are listed in the the jargon of Kyoto under Annex 1, uh, it's actually the jargon of something before Kyoto called the Berlin Mandate, which was for all industrial countries, which were obligated under the Berlin Mandate and um, uh, at Kyoto to take binding emission reduction measures under the Kyoto Treaty. And then developing countries, Annex B, it's kind of like when you have a list of three things, 1, B, and 3. Um, so there's Annex 1 and Annex B, and Annex B are the developing countries. And Annex B countries not only do not take binding reduction targets, um, uh, it's, it's almost structurally in the negotiations impossible for them to take a binding reduction target. What they are obligated to do is to take a policies and measures appropriate with their level of economic development. That was all enshrined in 1995. Uh, that's a long time ago. Um, we're uh, almost 20 years past, we will be 20 years past the Berlin Mandate when, uh, when climate negotiators assemble in Paris uh, next December. And so the question is, that, that phrasing is all under the heading of common but differentiated responsibilities. Since that time, China's economy has grown, by many estimates, 
by 2015 will be the largest economy in the world by, PP, by purchasing power parity. Um, and, uh, and India's will, you know, by various estimates, be the third largest, or already is the third largest economy, and, and will continue to grow. China's emissions are already the largest in the world. They're nearly double, and by next year, maybe double those of the United States. And China recognizes that because of the visibility of their emissions, they, they are um, quite uh, vulnerable in the international context and started working quietly with the United States and even publicly in some of the bilateral uh, negotiations to announce that they're going to work together on climate issues. India, prior to Mr. Modi's election, has been re reluctant to do that. But th their emissions are also rising. Um, if the U.S. is going to meet the targets that it announced at Copenhagen, they will come down by 2050 to a per capita level of, emission that, of, of emissions that is right now still twice more than what each Indian emits per capita. So India has a lot of room for its emissions to grow, and their emissions will grow without question as their economy grows, and probably grow quite dramatically, even above that level. I think the question, the two questions are, will India accept a common framework for talking about their emissions in a UN context? And if so, what are the policies and measures that it will take? And remember, this is very complicated at a policy level because it breaks back down to the states. So I think what you will see, probably not at this summit, but the beginning of a conversation at this summit, is India and the United States trying to work together both on the formal negotiations, but then on all the various policy and measures where the US and India can work together. So for instance, nuclear power, which is carbon free. Will there be breakthrough or at least a move to on the civilian nuclear agreement that uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had agreed to several years ago, but which have not been implemented? Will that move forward? Uh, will there be cooperation on renewables, solar, wind, um, even hydro, which is controversial, increasingly controversial in both countries. Um, and will you see American companies begin to invest in Indian infrastructure? Um, so th those are the kinds of issues that will come out, uh, not necessarily of this summit, but of the relationship in the next two years. And if we see a conversation that begins in that, uh, on those set of issues, it's, it's sort of the opening talks in something that will extend beyond that. So with that, um, I think we have uh, about a half hour to 40, uh, 35 minutes or so for questions and answers. I I'm going to ask a first question to Tanvi, open it to the group, and then we'll turn to the audience. So Tanvi, um, right before this summit, you alluded to the fact that um, uh, Prime Minister Modi met with uh, President Xi Jinping from China. It was billed as um, sort of a, the sequencing had been, he had first, he, Mr. Modi, first met with regional leaders right around the time of his inauguration. He then uh, met with leaders from Japan and Australia. And it seemed like he was levering that up to a great meeting with China. Gujarat had been an export place. Guangdong and many parts of China were export oriented. This was going to be a great economic relationship. And he was going to lever up some of the investment op pledges that Japan had made and was going to get a big bang. Big bang seemed to fizzle. What happened? I think the visit in many ways highlighted both the potential and the problems in the China-India relationship. You saw it in some ways starting off quite well. You saw the optics um, were quite, quite optimistic. Uh, President Xi Jinping making it a point to go to Prime Minister Modi's home state of Gujarat in signing deals, giving them a way to highlight not just the personal dimension, uh, but that for China, the relationship wasn't just with Delhi, but with states as well. Uh, you also did see kind of talk of economic uh, investment, uh, and you saw kind of connectivity being emphasized. But you also saw um, some th why and how something like the border dispute, which no matter how much talk of economic uh, uh, potential there is in the in the U.S. India sorry in the China India relationship, and there are also problems in that aspect. But no matter how much focus there might be on that, or how much China might want to focus on that, that this issue with the border can kind of seep into every aspect of the relationship. And significantly, the while this visit was going on, on the split screen in uh, on Indian news channels, you know the visit was playing out on one side, on the other side. 
uh, was talk of, uh, you, you can call it an incursion or transgression. The language used is different by the media and, and the governments, but from China to India in uh, what's called uh, the Western sector. Um, and that was playing out. And so what that does is it doesn't just kind of create the atmosphere, and in this case kind of uh, made it more pessimistic and negative for the broader conversation, but it also feeds into those that the mistrust about Chinese intentions that, that many in the Indian public have, uh, ra you know, uh, going back to kind of the 1960s. So I think what you saw is uh, uh, Xi Jinping trying to make it a point, and you saw expectations set that this was a way, um, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't say the visit was a disaster. I've heard some people say that. I actually think one of the problems was the expectations set were a bit too high. You had the Chinese Consul General, uh, no doubt with uh, Beijing's approval, putting out numbers like there was going to be a hundred billion dollars of investment uh, commitment. It didn't help that he actively, explicitly said compared this to Japan's thirty-five billion over seven years, and one that was only twenty billion dollars. Uh, it, if you compare to the $500 million of Chinese investment in India now, that's a huge jump. But if you compare to the $100 billion that people were expecting, it fizzled out. And I think the other aspect where you did see, and I think this has been an attempt uh, since uh, Li Keqiang went to India on his first foreign visit last year as premier, uh, you did see kind of an, an attempt by China to say, this is also one way for us to say uh, we respect India, we wanted to be part of kind of uh, the, the global community and be a power on the world stage. Uh, I suspect many in India will say they didn't go far enough. So I think, you know, overall, yes, there were some positive elements, but it did get colored by these, uh, these other aspects. And does that have a, does the failure to meet the expectations that were raised, um, is it likely to impact how India now thinks about the summit with the U.S.? Is it even less likely to ramp up expectations for this one? Does it, um, does it put more pressure on Mr. Modi to actually come to agreement on this one because the agreements seemed, uh, the agreements were less than promised and the disagreements were more than promised in the China uh, meeting? I think, you know, uh, visits to the U.S. by Indian prime ministers always get more intention than perhaps when Indian, uh, from the Indian media, from the Indian public, than visits to any other country. I think the uh, prime minister's visit uh, to Japan got a lot of attention, similar attention. But one of the things I think Indian and American policymakers have learned, and this is kind of a habit of cooperation that I don't think Chinese and Indian policymakers have reached that is that, and, and it's also because Indian American policymakers have got their fingers burnt, which is that try to keep realistic expectations. One of the things we saw in the last seven, six or seven years is you saw this kind of extreme expectation, extreme hype about the relationship. But I think there's more kind of realism about, yes, we are very hopeful about things moving forward, but let's also keep in mind that there are obstacles to things like implementation, et cetera. I think one of the problems in the case of China uh, was that I think th that learning hadn't happened. So I think this was almost the opposite in the attempt to try to make this visit larger than life and to compete with the visit, uh, the prime minister's visit to Japan. Um, there was kind of this expectation setting that was a bit high. I think what this will probably do for this visit, and you've already seen it, is government officials in, bo in both the Indian and the U.S. side try to can keep expectations realistic. I think they'll still be uh, still kind of uh, uh, be heightened. But I do think what this does is, and let's be clear, even before this visit, this is not a, a Modi government. You know, there's the business side minded Modi on China. There's a security minded Modi on China, and you saw that security minded thing in the Indian Foreign Minister a week before Xi Jinping. Came to came to or went to India, saying, uh, which usually Indian government officials wouldn't say explicitly, that India has a one-China policy, and so China should have a one-India policy, including accepting that Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims and calls South Tibet, is part of India. You saw the Prime Minister making fairly strong statements, if not explicit ones, uh, in Japan about, especially kind of uh, the East and South China Seas. But you also saw. Uh, the Indian president, even as Xi Jinping was in India, signing a joint declaration which put India very much on the part uh, on the side of the U.S. and Southeast Asian countries on the question of uh, of maritime disputes. So, speaking of maritime disputes, Josh, I guess the transition is to think about TPP as as the great trading area, and obviously the two other countries 
that Mr. Modi had previously visited right before the meeting with China were Japan and Australia, which got quite a lot of attention in India. Um, both Japan and Australia are pushing for a high standards uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And that's a challenge for both India and China. How do you see that playing out? Will that come up in the, in the meeting and in what way? And in particular, does the, does the Chinese-India um, joint uncertainty about that agreement affect the agreement moving forward? Um, so let me pick up on the China-India bit and get back on to the TPP, because I actually thought that your observation about leveraging relationships um, was a very um, good one, because I think, you know, when you look at the sequencing of visits where, he, you know, th there's been a visit to Japan and then there was the visit um, with China, and I think each relationship was leveraged, and I think there was clearly an attempt to leverage what was hoped to be a very good China visit to um, get some outcomes here in the United States. And um, to some extent, you know, because I think of the, the reason you've just discussed, um, I think that changes a little bit of um, a bit of the dynamics here. I mean, I think that, you know, for the United States, when it thinks, thinks about the TPP in, in the region, um, you know, it, it's clear that as, as a first order priority, um, you know, the United States uh, would like um, China to join at some point. Um, and, you know, I think you know, the TPP can only really be understood properly in those terms, both strategically and both in terms of what's actually being negotiated. A lot of the uh, chapters really, um, you know, the priority put on them, such as on state-owned enterprises, only makes sense in that context. I think, I think the, the, the broader sort of picture there for the United States is, is, is fundamentally one um, or, or, you know, stable and peaceful relations in the region and providing, you know, plenty of space for the peaceful rise and the development of both China and India, something uh, which I think everyone realises is a good thing for the United States and, and is a good thing globally. And the TBP is really about setting the framework on the trade and economic side for how that happens. And again, you know, concern in the United States about the sort of economic trajectory that China sort of has taken over the last 10 years, um, increasingly uh, state ownership of some of the key sectors of the economy. I mean, certainly there are still large areas where the market um, does develop. And concerns, though, about other issues relating from intellectual property to um, essentially this sense, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to use the word unfair, but a better sense that there's a lot of support that the Chinese government provides to businesses which um, sort of tilts a playing field, not only in China, but in third countries. And the TPP, a lot of that is about, is about trying to um, move away from that. And, and in that sense, um, you know, the, the thing we all know about trade agreements, right, is that the uh, negotiations are always talked about in a quid pro quo sense, that you do market access for market access, but at the end of the day, the real benefits come from liberalising your own economy. And, uh, you know, countries understand this. I mean, if you look back to China's accession to the WTO in 2001, you know, that the reforms that China undertook in order to join the WTO laid the groundwork for, China, for a lot of China's growth going forward. And in, in many respects, the TPP model is, is, is quite consistent with a lot of the economic reforms that India needs to take going forward and that China has talked about taking going forward. And so, um, you know, if, if, the, if there's a political space and an economic space, and, but getting into, um, you know, the TPP in, in many respects is, is a useful template or framework uh, which can help um, these, you know, the Indian government, the Chinese government grow, grow in, in the direction that they've already identified themselves as places they want to go. Now, you know, um, it's a very complex, I think, a, a situation now for um, India in terms of the sequencing and what actually happens in terms of the TPP uh, because there is a real push by the administration to finish the TPP at the end of the year. This is not talking about TPA or passing it through Congress, but simply I think there's clearly a desire to get some form of in-principle outcome that, that President Obama can announce at APEC in China later in um, this year. And the um, question really probably next year is going to be the next series of countries that join the TPP. There's already half a dozen at least that are keen to join in the, in the Asia-Pacific region. For instance, um, you know, South Korea has, has made it clear that it's one of those countries. Now, China has not formally said it wants to join the TPP. I think it's moved from seeing it as a containment strategy to something they're studying very closely. I think China um, for its faces a range of challenges during the TPP, not least the fact that it didn't 
shape the rules of the TPP in a sense, and so um, just acceding to the TPP, I think, for its own political reasons, might be a leap too far, so there might be a need to look at some way of getting China on board, which is, in a sense, a new negotiation, maybe a TPP plus arrangement, maybe something bilateral at the end of the day with the US, that that would be down the track. Um, but whatever happens, I think China, you know, is potentially a better place to, to become part of this um, earlier than India. And, and so India sort of needs to keep that in, in, in mind. I think if, if China could lock itself into that framework, it would certainly prevent a range of sort of economic challenges for India. And so how India can best prepare itself for the TPP world, whether or not it is formally part of it, or not, I think is part of how, uh, you know, the, the conversations that the Prime Minister needs to start having now. Uh, just as a, a point of tying these two together, in a, in a roundtable discussion where I was in, in India, I had mentioned something about TPP, and a questioner got back to me and said, look, we all understand why TPP would be good for our economy, but if we move forward on TPP, we bet we'll feel pressure on the border from the Chinese. And I thought, boy, that's sort of conspiracy theory, until all of a sudden they started feeling pressure on the border from the Chinese during the Modi summit. I thought, <laughs> okay, maybe this is just a much more complicated place than I thought. Um, Neil, I guess the, the question to you goes to, um, in the China-India context, you mentioned that Indian students are the number two uh, students coming to the foreign students in the United States, and number one, of course, is China. And I just I, I'd be interested in just an observation or two about the differences of those two. I mean, one sort of broad historical generalization is after Indian independence in '47 and uh, the victory of the Chinese communists in the in the late '40s, uh, China invested consistently in uh, primary education and higher education sort of was the sort of poor stepchild and during the Cultural Revolution and everything was actually gutted. And in India, it was the exact opposite. Nehru had this vision of a high-tech set of workers and uh, invested in the in Indian Institutes of Technology and, you know, there were 30 years or 40 years precedent to the high-tech boom that was an intentional government strategy, but what got left on uh, on the back burner was primary education. Do you see that in the in the different composition of uh, the college students coming to the United States from India and China? G give me a, give us a little sense of of how those different um, the, the demographics of those two different groups. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting when you kind of um, juxtapose India and China. Um, you have to think of the domestic comp um, composition as well. China itself has grown domestically in its higher education. The ratio of um, students who are entering higher education within China, um, especially from 2000 and the last decade. But India on itself has not. Um, public education has been stripped. There's much more demand for higher education in India. It only moved from, I think, 10% of higher education enrollment ratio to 13%. Over, and this is a large growth of high tech, but yet they're not, there's not enough institutions for Indians to go to within India. So, this is actually kind of interesting when you see the demographics of flows from China and India coming to the U.S. China does have a lot of STEM students going into the U.S., but largely dominated by business in particular. So China's doing a lot of good um, you know, education in the STEM fields within India. So a lot of them are coming to the U.S. to study business, and it makes sense in terms of export, imports, with a lot of business interests. India, on the other hand, has a lot of students coming into the U.S. to study master's degrees um, especially in the STEM fields. Um, this anomaly or this outlier of Hyderabad um, is kind of fascinating because of, at least what I've seen investigative reporters going, following through the report that I released, looking at what is going on there and is it connected to a lot of the IT industry or outsourcing that's going on there and the huge demand, again, for education in India. There's not enough opportunities, so if it's, there's a lot of private higher education in India, which is quite expensive. So if you juxtapose it with these schools that are you know, no, no name in, within the US, but to Indians, they're quite good schools. So it's an opportunity. It's cheaper on average than, than your Carnegie ranked universities. Um, I've, look, I've looked at it and it's like about $18,000 for a 18 month master's degree. Um, that's not too far off of higher price than a private higher education institution within India. So, but then you have the opportunity to come to the US, 
to vie for to to work for U.S. companies and possibly get an H-1B or stay permanently. So that cost there, the difference, if you're thinking about the calculation from a, someone from India, would you go to the private Indian university or you come to this no-name school in the U.S. but an opportunity to stay on longer? So it's kind of a very different demographic because with China, you do have a lot of business relations as well, a lot of MBAs coming to the U.S. And a lot of those students are either staying in the U.S. or going back. And actually, a lot of them are going back. There's a lot of opportunities for them for a lot of multinational companies that are in the U.S. Got it. So uh, time for questions from the audience. Uh, please uh, stand up. Let us know who you are and where you're from. And uh, if you could direct, uh, keep them questions, not comments, and direct them to uh, one of the panelists here. The gentleman here in the front row. Uh, Wolf Gross, now an independent consultant. Uh, this question is for Tanvi. Uh, just in the last few days, run up to the uh, Modi visit, the uh, White House has announced the most senior uh, Daishi in the U.S. government a little while ago uh, as the new ambassador. Uh, uh, almost simultaneously, the DOD has announced that it was going to put a, a one-star general in as the defense attache in Delhi. And shortly before that, the director of the, or chief of the Office of Defense Cooperation was on the list for one-star uh, naval officer. Uh, what, if anything, is the upgrade of these positions going to have on the atmospherics of the visit? I think the atmospherics are important. Wolf, as you know from your own experience, uh, they perhaps matter more um, in terms of being read in India than with most other relationships. There is an expectation that, uh, I call it U.S.-India exceptionalism. That both countries believe they're exceptional. They expect to be treated as exceptional. And they can't understand often why they are not being upgraded to that exceptional category sometimes, or at least they feel that they're not. So I think this is, a, this is part of the set of signals that the Obama administration is showing. And it is an opportunity for the president, who, in terms of his foreign policy legacy, uh, can make the argument that, or can say, if he can say at the end of his administration that he left this relationship with the world's largest democracy, as people love to say in speeches on U.S.-India relations, uh, if he can leave this relationship better off than he received it, and it was in a pretty good state then, uh, that this would be a major foreign policy legacy, especially in terms of if he and Prime Minister Modi have said that Asia is, the 21st century is the Asian century. Um, and I think between the various uh, U.S. government officials visiting India fairly speedily, uh, but starting from the outreach in the beginning, from President Obama, Secretary Kerry, uh, National Security Advisor Susan Rice to their counterparts just after the elections, uh, but also where you saw uh, within the space of two weeks, three administration officials, senior administration officials, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel, and Secretary Pritzker go to India, uh, taking major teams with them. Uh, and uh, there have been other officials as well, from the Energy Department, from Homeland Security, kind of reflecting the broad array. Uh, and now kind of these upgradations um, show that the administration, despite you know, the Middle East uh, in, in chaos, despite concerns about what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, wants to highlight that this relationship and try to make this relationship work. Uh, and I think you know, it's going, we're, we're going to wait and see how it's reciprocated. But there is a sense, I think, that this might be a moment that if this government can deliver, um, uh, that it, it can actually move forward on things that for the last three years have been somewhat stalled. Uh, the Indian foreign minister, when asked kind of what would be different uh, in a recent press conference, in her first press conference as foreign minister, was asked, you know, why is uh, this government dealing with China or, India or the U.S. different? And she said, because this is a stronger government. I suspect in the case of China and perhaps the U.S., she meant it in a kind of more security uh, we'll protect Indian respect, et cetera, or uh, uh, India's uh, um, status. But I think it also, it, how it's seen here is that this potentially, with the kind of mandate that the government has, and if it can get things done, uh, that this relationship can actually move forward, that there is an opportunity and desire on, uh, on the Indian side. And I suspect this last uh, round is also getting the sense from the Indian, new Indian government that they will reciprocate. I don't think these things would have happened if on those first few visits there was a sense that this was going nowhere. 
Um, woman in the fourth row, please, on the left. Thank you. Um, I'm Shruti from Albright Stonebridge. Uh, my first question is for, I have two questions, I'll keep them really short. But my first is for Neil. Um, I wanted to know if you had any uh, thoughts on, um, you know, US um, immigrants that come into the US but pay into the social security system and don't receive any economic benefits from it. Is that something that, um, you know, that will come up in US-India talks in future? Um, and my second question is sort of broadly um, to the panel. Um, you've focused on, I mean, you've spoken about counterterrorism, trade, immigration, and climate change. But what we've seen with Modi is that he has a focus on deals. When Xi visited, three MOUs were signed within the first hour. So do you see any sort of tangible deals emerging in any of these areas that you've discussed based on recent announcements? Neil, you know, do you want to take the first one and then we'll... Yeah, I'll take the first. Um, first off, that you know, most immigrants, especially if you think about Indian immigrants coming to the U.S., they're going into high-skilled jobs and occupations. Um, so these are, they're paying a lot of taxes. Um, they're going also paying into the social security system, so it's a quite a lot of money um, that's going in, into the US government from a lot of high-skilled immigrants. So that's, that's something in terms of, I don't know if that's gonna be a particularly topic of conversation, but it's, a, it's an issue that's with a lot of immigrants in the US. And then the question is like, what do you do if they return back to their country of origin, if they're coming between the two countries, do, can they be portable? And there's been a lot of conversation, I know, on portability of social security systems. Um, that's something that hasn't really moved forward. There's been kind of ideas out there, but it's not something, but it's something that you could think, should think about. I think the emphasis on deals, I'm sure there'll be a few, if nothing else, to make sure that people can say, we've got deliverables and that's what the focus will be on. But I think this is different from, say, the Japan visit or the China visit for a couple of reasons. I think in some ways, many of the deals have been reached. Um, over the last few years. Uh, the fact that the relationship you know, has gone from sanctions 15 years ago to as close of, uh, a, a relationship as it is now is significant. And a lot of deals have been signed along the way. And I think uh, the focus over the next few months, and that's why I said this is the beginning, or perhaps just part of a key moment in the process, but looking at the process as a whole doesn't make for exciting kind of news headlines. And I suspect that's where the optics will be focused on uh, rather than kind of necessarily substance because that might not be as exciting. I wouldn't be surprised, and I know that, that on both sides, uh, officials are trying to work till the last moment to actually get deals done. Uh, but the, where it's different from China and, and the relationships with China and Japan is, uh, for one, I think, as I said, a lot of things, uh, deals have been made. It's about implementing them. Uh, the low-hanging fruit have already been picked, so the, 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 steps, the, the deals in the next few years are going to be harder to achieve. Uh, and finally, you know, and this goes back to the, is kind of China and Japan and what those visits, uh, how they're going to play into it. One of the things that folks have pointed out is that the U.S. can't make that $20 billion or $35 billion worth of commitment because that's not what the government does. The Chinese and Japanese governments can do that. Here it's going to be private sector driven. Uh, and that is why I think Josh had a great phrase, this is a roadshow. Uh, partly to say, come, and I suspect we'll hear the phrase make in India once more, but also terms of, in terms of technology, uh, the fact that uh, Modi will likely talk to uh, Bloomberg about smart cities, etc. This is about investment, technology, and those kind of deals you won't necessarily get now, but you'll see this visit, I think, not just what has gone in, but what might be coming out of it over the next year or so. Gentleman here in the front. I have a question for Josh. You indicated the importance, you think, of increased participation in, in trade for India. Right now, what are the opportunities for export, for Indian exports? To, to, well, so... Um, you know, there... It, 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 I mean, broadly speaking, um, you know, there's, India has got a lot of opportunities. I mean, if you think about this globally also in terms of what it can do in terms of building out the bilateral relationship with the United States, I mean, I think that if the Prime Minister is successful in building out a manufacturing strategy in India, there is enormous scope for India to become, in a sense, the next factory of the world. As China, as particularly as, as wages in China go up, um, there's a lot of scope for India to fill a lot of that space, but it's going to require, as I said, a lot of um, 
domestic reform in order for that to become a reality, but the potential is, is certainly there. Um, I think on the, on the services side, um, India's already demonstrated um, its significant potential to uh, grow that sector. Um, and there, there's a lot of scope for that to grow further. It, 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 you, if you look at how the services sector started out in India, which was in a sense um, a fairly you know, low-skilled back office type of work, and over time um, that skill sector has increased um, as the, um, the education and the ability of the Indian workforce has increased as companies both in the United States but also in Europe and elsewhere have gr gained increasing confidence in what they can do in India. You're starting to see um, more high-end um, services through to um, establishing R&D facilities in India happen and there is clearly a lot of scope to uh, build that out further and as I was saying I think the IT revolution and growth in, in internet access and this is where some of my work on, on cross-border data flows comes into it. As long as those trajectories are maintained, I think there's a lot of opportunity for India in that, in that place as well. Yeah, India is the only, I think it's the only major economy in the world that has a services trade surplus with the United States. That is, they export more services to us than we uh, export to them. And, and clearly what they're trying to catch up on is manufacturing. And what was fascinating to me, and I think I mentioned I, I visited um, six states in 12 days. Every single one of those states is now um, exploring, and many of them had already been exploring, but particularly with Modi, export zones. You know, pri you know, sort of special export zones where you can come in and do, and they often refer to it as either Singapore style or China style. Um, you come in, have uh, either foreign or local investment in a manufacturing facility where you make the stuff and then you export it. And there are tax breaks and all kinds of other concessions like land and water and power that go into those. And they're exploring them on the coast and they're exploring them inland and they're really trying to promote them. And the states are all competing with one another um, and explaining why our state's better to do business than that state. The other thing that was fascinating for me to see is in a couple, uh, couple places, they're really developing ports and investing quite a lot in ports um, on the east coast between Chennai, which is already a manufacturing hub, and Kolkata, which is a long manufacturing hub that's been in decline. There are two or three ports that are developing, and they're exploring things like agricultural exports, aquaculture, you know, shrimps and prawns. They're seeing that they could triple that number in the next, uh, in the next five years. Um, so it's, it's actually... All across India, there's quite a diversity in, in the range of things that they're thinking to export. But he's very focused on this because he wants to build up a, um, he, Modi, is, uh, you know, he wants to build up a, a current account surplus. He thinks that that was a big part of China's growth strategy and he wants it. Um, so in the back, uh, in the checkered shirt, about seven rows back. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Prabhat Sinha. I have a question for Tanvi. Uh, what do you think about uh, um, uh, about dialogue we'll have uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Obama will have a dialogue about uh, U.S., uh, Afghanistan, and uh, India relationship, specifically with uh, economic development and uh, uh, I India's, uh, uh, Afghanistan's new government current new government and uh, uh, Chinese China's involvement in Afghanistan, specifically with um, uh, Shanghai Corporation? I think there are kind of two dimensions to this, or, or rather three. On the kind of U.S.-India discussion, it will be a, a key feature, both because it is something, it's a concern that both uh, India and the U.S. share. Uh, the U.S. has been supportive of the economic kind of de development relationship uh, that India has with Afghanistan. There's the India-US-Afghanistan trilateral, although there have been some concerns in India that there haven't been kind of two meaty discussions and that it needs to be revived somewhat. Um, so you might see some of that. I think um, Afghanistan is actually one area where China and India and the US actually have a fair amount of com in common. Uh, all have an interest in stability. Uh, China and India's pro major projects there, mining projects, have actually been stalled because of security concerns. China and, India and the U.S. all uh, have concerns about what that kind of post-drawdown uh, uh, post, uh, uh, future will look like. Um, so I think especially now that there is some sense that there's been a political agreement, uh, you could potentially see 
um, some discussions about, you know, the China and India, for example, now have an official dialogue in Afghanistan. The U.S. and India obviously have one with Afghanistan. Uh, one of the key unsaid factors, and it'll be this is where it gets challenging, because while they have an interest in stability, so the goal is the same, their ways of getting there are not necessarily the same. And the question is where and how is Pakistan going to feature in, which is a key part of this. It's not just kind of a trilateral plus Afghanistan, uh, but of Pakistan, Iran, it's connected up to the larger region. I think in terms of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it's interesting. Um, you know, in, this, was, this was very much seen. I mean, India has put in a, a formal application, and, and uh, President Xi saw this as a way to convey that, um, saying that China would endorse it, saw it as a way of conveying that, you know, it wants India to be part of kind of global and will help uh, uh, India's entry into global organizations. Uh, note they didn't come out and say endorsing India, a permanent seat for India at the, on the UN, UN Security Council. So the Shanghai Cooperation Organization membership perhaps APEC membership eventually, uh, they might actually talk about. Uh, for India, you know, I think there's still a debate in India about what exactly it is that SEO membership will get India. Um, the advocates say that, you know, it will help India connect with Central Asia, it shouldn't be left out. Uh, and, but critics in India itself say that, listen, this is a kind of a China-Russia-led um, semi-authoritarian um, or group that it's not quite clear what the purpose and what India's membership uh, would really bring. Uh, the official reaction here that you've heard, at least publicly, uh, has been that you know it might be good to have India as a democracy in this uh, in this grouping. Uh, it might change the flavor of things and give the other countries besides uh, China and Russia in that group an option uh, and an alternative to kind of look towards. Here in the third row. Hi, uh, this question is really to anyone in the panel who can answer it, but it, do, do uh, sorry, my name is Aman Sharif, I'm an independent consultant, um, and uh, it goes back to something that Dr. Madan said about how decentralization, um, one of the seven Ds, uh, is there an experience that the U.S. has had in the past of dealing with another country that is similarly decentralized in a federal system where direct central government to central government uh, trade or policy making isn't really an option. Gosh, uh, Bill, yes. Bill wrote the book on the subject, so I'm gonna. <laughs> uh, first of all, there's there's no country in the world like India, even China, um, you know, which is of similar size and complexity. Um, the formal recognition of the diversity of the Indian states um, and their ability to keep it together is just an extraordinary accomplishment. I mean, you know, I, I, I like to joke in the book that India's constitution is, um, whereas the US constitution is elegant at 7,000 words, India's constitution is sort of an elephant at 150,000 words. It's twice or three times longer than my book, whereas uh, the US constitution is one chapter. Um, that poses both opportunities and challenges for American states. Um, China is the only place that's as big, as big and complex unless you think about the geopolitical diversity of North and South America and the European Union all added up. Um, in the China context, what the U.S. has done is actually coordinate this at the Secretary of State Foreign Minister level. So Secretary Clinton and uh, U.S. Ambassador John Huntsman uh, had two summits with their counterparts um, in China that brought together governors from the United States and provincial party secretaries for China. So they all had came together and had a big conference and then the um, US governors when they visited China went out and sort of dispersed themselves among the states and started doing deals of one kind or another. So Jerry B Brown in Guangdong province on clean energy and climate change, for instance, has become a real going concern. In the US context, for years, governors and senators have done these sort of trade missions. Senator Warner has been a leader in the United States for this. Um, when he was a governor, he did this kind of thing. And now that he's a senator, he's the, I think he's the uh, Senate chair of the India caucus. And he's seen great opportunities in the high tech space, which is a big, important um, set of issues uh, for the state of Virginia. And if there's defense cooperation, I'm sure he's going to be all over that, right? I mean, this is the exact kind of thing that as a governor he would be interested in doing. It hasn't been centrally coordinated and managed in the US context. 
with Modi as a former Indian virgin chief minister, not a governor. Um, I, I think there is a real opportunity there and on a range of issues, economic development, clean energy and climate, educational issues. There's a whole set of things that uh, transportation and infrastructure, you know, in the US, as our Metro program has taught me, 50% of the spending for that is always at the state and local level. And a lot of the policy design comes in from Washington, but it's always adapted and decided locally because of local zoning and local traffic and, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, India has a fairly similar experience, actually quite different from China, where it is much more centralized. So you have these Chinese cities look a lot more like one another in terms of how the ring road is built and where the center city is. India, you know, it's sort of all over the place and quite complex. There could be a real set of cooperative efforts there. India has started doing that kind of thing with places like Great Britain. With the United States, it hasn't been sort of formally done at the central level. I, I think, frankly, it was a good idea not to try to load that into the first, um, first meeting between the heads of state because they are both getting to know one another. And I think it's really important for them to establish a common bond. In, in many ways, Modi's own experience is quite similar to President Obama's. He was elected with this enormous expectations. He's got to figure out what his team is. He's still working to do that. Um, he's got to figure out what his policy priorities are. He's still, frankly, working to figure out what to do that is. So loading a lot of that stuff up front while he's feeling his way was probably not a, a great idea. And so I'm, I'm glad that it, they've sort of set the expectations where they have. I'd just like to jump in on the kind of learning bit, which plays into both the question, because it's not just uh, the U.S. needing to learn how to deal with this kind of very diverse country that is perhaps more diverse than any other country and certainly large and diverse uh, than any others, but India learning to do the same with the U.S. I mean, after all, for India as well, they're dealing with a large, diverse country. And unlike, I mean, this relationship is unique because it involves so many actors and so many levels. And you do see now an attempt um, to kind of, you know, governors uh, going to India, but Indian chief ministers coming here, uh, city to city interaction, the private sectors uh, get involved. And you've seen, as for example, Indian companies have invested here, um, you know, I didn't, didn't think that I would op put on a news channel and see an ad from Mahindra and Mahindra uh, tractors in the US. But you do see that today. But what this has also meant is those companies have had to learn how to deal in a very dis diverse country as well. Now, in some ways, the fact that Indians and American companies and official politicians know how to deal with diversity in their own countries can potentially help as well. It makes implementation challenging. The other thing about learning kind of on a more personal level, I think uh, there, this is, you see that Pr Prime Minister Modi is aware that in some ways he doesn't want to get to the point where the expectations uh, are, are left unmet, that all this talk of hope that doesn't actually meet uh, expectations and that there is a danger of that. And one good way of actually seeing that is in just, not just in his speeches where he says, you know, it's not just expectations and hope I have to deliver, but you also see this if you go to his website. He has a section called, it used to be called Hope, and now it's called Hope in Action. Um, because there is a realization based on looking at experiences, including those of President Obama, that that action part uh, will, all this foreign policy, uh, all these kind of co this competitive courting uh, will not be possible uh, for India to take advantage of if that action part doesn't get, um, doesn't get delivered. In the, in the back, there's a gentleman uh, with his hand up on the left side. Thank you. My name is Kumar, and I'm in business. India is almost dead last in terms of ease of doing business. And I understand in Gujarat, Modi first tamed the bureaucracy before big bang reforms occurred and Gujarat took off. Do you think he's following the same policy at the center? He's definitely, if I'll take this one, and I think uh, Congressman Engel's here, so I'll do this one quickly. He's definitely sending that message. But he faces a fork in the road. Uh, and you know, as a New York Yankees fan and a Yogi, Yogi famously phrased Yogi Berra fan, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, he's saying, we're going to make ease of doing business a priority. And on the central bureaucracy, which he controls, he is hammering that home. Get things done. 
don't get stuck in the red tape, red carpet, not red tape. On the other hand, a lot of the action still happens in the states. And the BJP only controls five states. So his direct ability to go to people who, um, who are part of his party is limited to a relatively small part of India. And the states that matter, um, at least in terms of the immediate ability to do manufacturing, which is his critical agenda, um, Gujarat is controlled by his state. Maharashtra is not, I mean, by his party. Maharashtra is not controlled by his party. Tamil Nadu is not controlled by his party. Kolkata is not controlled by his party. Hyderabad is not controlled by his party. The main manufacturing parts of India are not controlled by his party. So that's his challenge moving forward. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Strobe Talbot and, uh, and Congressman Engel. Uh, now we have a chance to continue the conversation. And I'm glad I got at least a few minutes towards the end of the, uh, at least the last panel that uh, Bill Antholis and Tanvi were involved in. Uh, we now have a chance to hear from uh, a member of the United States Congress uh, who I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with since uh, the early 90s when I came into the executive branch. This is your 25 years. Is that possible? 26. <laughs> who's, but, who's, but who's counting? counting. Right. Uh, and Congressman Engel, as I think you all know, is the ranking member of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, he was a founder of the Congressional uh, Caucus, uh, India Caucus. Uh, he has uh, been paying very, very close attention to the evolution of the U.S. relationship. And I can say as somebody who was involved from the administration back in the, in the 90s, uh, he was uh, a good friend to India and a very wise counselor to those of us uh, who were trying to nurture uh, that relationship. Uh, and so thank you so much for being with us, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, there was, in the earlier part of this conference, quite a bit of discussion about the changing geopolitics, if I can put it that way, of East Asia, and particularly as it relates uh, to South Asia. Uh, you've recently been uh, down in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, did the issue of uh, India-Chinese relations come up very much, and uh, how, I know that, uh, of course, everybody knows that uh, Prime Minister Modi has found several venues uh, to express his concern about certain aspects of Chinese policy uh, in the region. How much did that figure in your latest trip? Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and hello to everybody out there. And uh, let me first say, Strobe, that I've uh, long uh, admired your work when you were part of the administration. You were not only someone that we all uh, felt was hardworking and competent, but you also uh, were, were a very nice person. And I'm a big believer in that uh, those, those co two combinations are, are very, very good. Uh, and um, we appreciated all of the way you always handled yourselves and conducted yourselves and was always yourself. And it was always uh, something that uh, those of us who were in Congress knew that when we um, needed to, to call you, you were always um, available and there and um, very much appreciated. I've always had great admiration for you personally. Thank you. And um, let, me, let me say that when we formed the India Caucus, I guess it was 1994 or something like that, we were um, just a few of us. But I have always felt I came to Congress in 1988. Uh, I joined the Foreign Affairs Committee January of 89. It was the first committee to which I belonged. And now I'm, I'm ranking member on the committee. Um, I have always felt that the U.S.-India relationship was a very important relationship for so many reasons. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about democracy. Um, we're both democracies. We always say it's sort of a trite or hackneyed statement, but it's true that the United States is the oldest democracy and India is the largest democracy. When we looked at the Indian elections where Modi won, it was the largest uh, amount of participation of any think, dem democracy or democratic elections in the history of humankind. And um, despite some of the strains in our relationship, and frankly those strains are, are something that I never quite fully understood um, because it seemed to me, and it seems to me, that India and the U.S. are natural allies, 
should be natural allies. And during the battles of the Cold War, when India had good relations with the Soviet Union, uh, there seemed to be a strain that we could never quite get close to India because they were close to the Soviets. But uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, I thought then it gave both countries a great opportunity uh, to move uh, into the future. And there's another uh, aspect of it, and that is the, the very significant and growing Indian American population in the United States uh, coming from New York and coming from um, communities in New York, uh, many immigrant communities. New York is, is, is the center of, of, of national community. Um, I, I have always found that hyphenated Americans have uh, forged great ties uh, between their, their home country and their adopted country, the United States, and, and makes the ties uh, get even stronger and, 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 and grow because of, of people who, who again, come from one country and, and now live in the United States. And I, uh, one of the reasons I'm pro-immigration, because I think that, by and large, people who come to the United States are the best and the brightest. You know, la lazy people, I always say it, I always get to chuckle at home, lazy people can stay home, but industrious people don't. They pick up, they leave their country, they come to the United States, they um, take a great chance and risk, but it's the type of personality of people that want to come. And the Indian American community is among the forefront of, of, of that, uh, very highly educated, very highly motivated. And so I just think it's a natural. And when you talk about China and my trip to Australia and New Zealand, yeah, I, I, I think that while we, we, there are many reasons for us to be uh, friendly and close with India, um, I, I think that there is, is some kind of eye uh, on, on China and what's, what's happening on China. And while the United States wants to and should strive to have good relations with China, I think that India and the U.S., both being democracies, have frankly a lot more in common. And I think that um, uh, India um, you know, casts a little bit of a wary eye uh, to, to China. And um, the United States and China, of course, uh, relations are, are much better than they were 20 and 30 and 40 years ago, but there's still a little bit of rivalry there. China's building its military. Um, so I, I just think it's a natural um, alliance for the United States and India, and it frustrates me to no end uh, that uh, irritants seem to be cr uh, creeping up all the time. Silly things, I think, in, that, that may impede closer Indian-U.S. ties. So in Australia, uh, and in New Zealand, there, there is some wariness about, about China, the feeling that um, it's natural that they would have a closer relations with India. There was uh, something announced when we were there um, about uh, working with Japan, India, uh, and the United States, and, and Australia uh, in, in partnership, in, in a military uh, partnership. And I think that because Australia and New Zealand are so close to Asia, uh, that it's just natural that they're really uh, on top of these things. So I just think there are lots of possibilities. Uh, I'm excited that Modi is is coming to town. I'm going to meet with him next week in New York. There's going to be a big rally at Madison Square Garden with the uh, Indian American community. There's going to be uh, to see him and, and interact with him in a huge platform with thousands of people. And then um, I've been invited to several small meetings with him as well. So I'm really excited about it. Since you know uh, President Obama very well, too, uh, what do you think is the most and the best that we could hope for coming out of there as they build a personal relationship? Well, as you know, personal relationships are important. Um, I, I really, uh, through history, through time, um, it can really change the course of history. And I'm hoping, you know, they say first impressions are the first impressions, and I'm hoping that the first impression that both Obama and Modi have of each other uh, are good, and I hope that um, any kind of um, past irritants or past peaks of, of uh, annoyance are, are, are put away, because I just think this is a great opportunity. I think there is, there is such pride, first of all, I've seen in the Indian American community with Modi. Uh, I, I think that um, there's great opportunity for uh, our countries to really work, work closely together. And I, and I believe that, that Obama and Modi will, will um, uh, have a good 
meeting and a good relationship and um, um, things will move in a positive direction. There, there's really no reason for it not to. I mean, there is no reason. We, we had this, um, this spat with the uh, Indian uh, in, uh, diplomat who was hiring help and we had the whole thing. You know, to me, it just seemed, I don't want to belittle it by saying much ado about nothing, but I, but it just seemed like it uh, was. Um, uh, it took too much of our space in the U.S.-India relationship. It, it it took too much time. It was emphasized too much. And I really, really think it should have been just a small little blip on a uh, on a larger uh, screen, a larger relationship, where we want to uh, both sides really want to bring people together. I want to tell you that one of the most moving things that I've done in my twenty six years in Congress, was in 1997, I traveled with a group from the Foreign Affairs Committee to India, and we sat in Delhi in the, in the parliament at midnight uh, in 1997, which was the 50th anniversary of India's independence at that time. And the, uh, the, the gong, the clock struck midnight, and the gong was there 50, day, 50 years to the second of India's uh, independence. And it was really something of all the places I've traveled that I uh, remember very well. You've referred twice to the irritants in general and once to the specific one involving the consular officer in New York. It's, it's my impression that while it was sort of a perfect storm on, in, in a bad way, um, there was a lot of good work done quietly, including uh, by Ambassador State Department. And they, they seem to have put it... Uh, behind them. Is that your impression as well? Yes, because, you know, the, the newspapers love to play it up, and um, it seemed to at some point go out of hand, and there was a lot of uh, quiet diplomacy in the, in the background um, to put it behind us, and, and yes, I think it was. As, as a former journalist, I, I must say I find the Indian press uh, lively to an extent that just uh, makes the American press seem tame sometimes. <laughs> Well, again, it's a democracy, and that's, again, you know, I want to keep stressing um, why the United States and India have so much in common and should strive to um, make relations as, as, as good as possible. Well, uh, you, of course, are also very closely in touch with the private sector uh, here in the United States and, and have done a lot to uh, help uh, advance the economic and commercial relationship between I sense that there's still some frustration on both sides there. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi came to office with a great deal of support from the Indian Prime Minister. That is representing an opportunity to really take uh, the economic relationship to a new level. I do, and I hope that gets back to the question you asked about Obama and Modi. Um, I, I think that will be a large part of what they discuss, um, and I think it should be. Um, I think that both countries need to concentrate on improving their relationships. You know, while you have other countries, we, we mentioned China, we mentioned Australia, we mentioned, we didn't mention some of the others, but um, I think the U.S. and India have a lot um, to talk about. And I really hope that there will be a, a new trail blazed, and I think that they will spend a great deal of their time talking about uh, economic trade and, and things like that to uh, enhance our countries. Well, when we were uh, waiting to come in here, we talked uh, briefly but uh, pointedly about the situation in the Middle East uh, and particularly the threat of terrorism in general and ISIS in particular. Uh, would you share my view that there is room for increased partnership between India and the United States on what West Asia all of the Middle East, particularly since uh, India itself has been the victim of terrible acts of uh, But there doesn't seem to be yet uh, a great deal of diplomatic accord, uh, not just on the perceptions, but on action. Well, uh, yes, um, I, I think that the international terrorism is the scourge of, of the world. It, it's not confined to one area, although it, it predominates in the Middle East, but it, it can go all over. I mean, we unfortunately have had attack, an attack in, in New York and at the Pentagon on September 11th. Um, 
you've had attacks in Bali, Bali you've had certainly in, in Mumbai and other places. And these various terror groups, whether it's you know uh, Hezbollah or ISIS or Hamas or Al Shabaab or you name it, I can keep naming them. They all have one thing in common: they want to use terror uh, to further their political aims. And uh, a country like India, as you mentioned, has lived through a lot of it. And I think ultimately, uh, this is the big issue of the uh, 21st century. It's how to combat the scourge of terrorism. And no nation is immune, and we need every nation's help because we can't do it alone. And everyone knows that just last night, the, uh, the bombings in, in Syria began. And um, a lot of us uh, in, in Congress who uh, supported, and I, I, I voted to support the president in uh, training the Syrian rebels, uh, but one of the things that I and others have stated uh, it can and only every time be the United States uh, doing it and everybody sort of following, and the United States sort of is always the one in the fo forefront. Yes, we have the, the know-how, and yes, we have the ability, um, but it has to be a partnership uh, by all the countries of the world or almost all the countries of the world because terror knows no boundaries, and, and terror by its very nature is, is frightening, and strikes at civilians, innocent civilians, because that's how they use their terror. So it's not where, you know, we may have thought in America, and I think we did until September 11th, 2001, that the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean protected us, and that whatever happened over there was over there, it was in another continent, another part of the world, uh, it, it wouldn't affect us. And we saw really how vulnerable we were on September 11th, with uh, virtually very little money and, and a well thought out and planned out plot. We had 3,000 of our uh, country men and women murdered in cold blood. Um, while we're sitting here, various terrorist organizations are, are plotting and planning ways to disrupt uh, by terror, and uh, nobody's immune. It could happen anywhere. It could happen in uh, Washington, New York, Delhi, Mumbai, you name it. I can name every city in the world. And so I think that there is also room for cooperation between the U.S. and India in this regard as well. And again, India, because it's um, second, I think, in population, projected to become first in population in the not-too-distant future, uh, India is a natural. And India is a natural for lots of things. You know, we didn't mention it, but I'm going to mention it. We have the, the U.N. Security Council um, meeting in New York uh, starting Tomorrow, uh, I was just in New York running around to a series of meetings with, with some of the world leaders. And there's been talk of, of India um, becoming a, a member, permanent member of the Security Council. And I think if the Security Council is ever going to expand, uh, India would be a, a natural uh, member uh, for that expansion. You know, the problem with the UN Security Council is it's locked into 1945. 1945 is when it was put up where there would be five permanent members, and that was the world in 1945. The world has changed a lot in 70 years. Lots of countries that state claim to wanting permanent membership, India being one of those, and my personal belief is that a number of countries should be considered, but I think India should be a lock for that. I agree that that reform is necessary from my own time in the State Department. It, it's, uh, it felt like the problem from hell. It was, in other words, it, unlo unlocking that lock is very hard. And I, I suspect you would agree that we, we meet, need to do everything we can with the bilateral relationship and all the money now that uh, that's been there. So uh, uh, we can't wait for uh, such time as there'll be you know, a reform of the Security Council. You no, know, the bilateral relationship, uh, we can do that on our own. We don't have to wait for any other nation except, of course, for India. Um, and I just think it makes sense. And um, if I had my druthers, we would really make it a, a major priority in our, in our foreign policy. Um, India, of course, is a nuclear power, um, over a billion population, way over a billion population. Um, and you just uh, see uh, the change 
Uh, of course, India is going through a lot of things that other countries are going through. There is increasingly a large gap between the poor and the very wealthy. Uh, that's something that a lot of countries are going through, even our own, but it's probably um, very uh, profound in India. But there are lots of bilateral uh, negotiations and things that we should and could come up with. And um, you know, as I said before, it has long frustrated me that I think that we, we haven't made more progress up, till now, up until now. We should. It's good for both countries. It makes sense. And I hope, again, that when Obama and Modi meet, um, they have a personal chemistry which will help accelerate things in the direction we don't like to see. Well, that, it's very good of you to end on that uh, upbeat, which seems to be justified by all the signals that we're hearing. And we promise to uh, let you go by 1230. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. And please join me in thanking Thank you. Congress. My pleasure. Thank you.